Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on opening new business doors for agricultural transformation with focus on youth entrepreneurship in farm value chains and rural development. The, this webinar will be an hour and 30 minutes with speakers presenting their points of view in the first hour, followed by 20 minutes of Q&A and closing remarks. Speakers will be discussing opportunities, constraints, and challenges faced by youth entrepreneurs working in agribusiness in developing countries. My name is Nandita Shravastav, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to submit them in the question box in your side panel at any time. I will read these questions out during the Q&A session. Please note this webinar will be recorded and the slides and the recording session of the webinar will be posted on the events page at ifpre.org. I will introduce each speaker as they come in. To begin, I'm pleased to introduce Simon Winter, who is the Executive Director of Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture. He will reflect on how to bring youth in the development process, highlight a few global youth challenges, including a brief reflection on youth and COVID. With that, over to you, Simon. Thanks, Nandita. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good evening. Um, uh, delighted to be here and joining you on this very important topic. Why is this an important topic for Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture? We are an organization that is uh, aiming to help yeah, um, on, uh, entrepreneurial farmers uh, who live in remote and low-income communities in Asia and Africa to uh, advance their agricultural fortunes. Um, and we seek to do this through a range of uh, approaches to bringing better technologies uh, close to and accessible and usable by those farmers uh, with the knowledge of how to use those technologies and then with good access to markets, good access to finance and so on. And this, these are all elements of this transformation that's needed. What's most uh, important uh, among these things is the access to um, uh, knowledge and products close to the farmers. Um, uh, what is often called the last mile or first mile challenge, depending on whether you're distributing inputs or uh, trying to supply uh, your produce into output markets. Um, and in order to uh, close that last mile, we are very keen on finding young entrepreneurial people in uh, those communities who can then become uh, the agents of change, the change champions for uh, for their communities. So the notion of agricultural entrepreneurship is very important for us. In Africa, we are a co-founder and co-supporter of an initiative that's hosted by AGRF, uh, the Africa Green Revolution Forum called Generation Africa. Um, in order to do our work, we not only uh, develop the actual interventions, but we also look at the policy environments, the enabling environment. And IFPRI is a regular partner of ours in terms of examining policy issues like uh, approaches to extension, approaches to mechanization, uh, and other aspects of the enabling environment. The study uh, that we're going to be showcasing today looks at um, policy, institutional, technological, and individual factors that can really unleash a, a new wave of young agricultural and rural entrepreneurship uh, to tackle the challenges I uh, alluded to. Um, and there are three countries in the study, Nigeria, India, and Bangladesh. Today's uh, symposium is uh, focusing on the Nigeria uh, case study. Why is this important in the world uh, and not just to us as a foundation? Well, uh, we all know that uh, farmers uh, across the world, not just in uh, low-income developing regions, are aging. Young people typically don't want to uh, be farming, and that challenge is even greater in the communities that we're focused on because uh, of the lives of drudgery and hardship that their parents experience. And young people want to do something which uh, involves new technologies, uh, which involves uh, faster rotation of cash in and out of their pockets so that they can pay for their uh, cell phone uh, data, for example, and other uh, needs that they have. Um, and uh, this is hard in, in these rural areas. There's too little opportunity. There are limits on access to land, limits on access to finance, limits on access to training uh, and advice, um, other services like insurance, and of course, uh, challenges on market access. 
So uh, we w ideally want the best of the young people uh, with the best uh, intentions for their communities to stay in those communities, but uh, things have to change. And in particular, in the COVID period, this has been accentuated uh, because of the challenges on mobility um, uh, and uh, loss of jobs. So many of the young people who've actually found jobs, maybe in the nearby towns and things, have then lost those jobs. Um, and many programs that are designed to support entrepreneurs, including some of our own, uh, have had to be postponed because of uh, challenges in terms of mobility and uh, needing to uh, stay safe and healthy and so on. Um, this has, on the other hand, opened up opportunities around digitalization. Uh, and in some of our programs, we've now digitized and restarted those programs, um, uh, which actually is a, is a great thing for the future because uh, we can now take advantage of better technologies. Uh, but the immediate consequence of COVID, according to a survey that was carried out by Generation Africa that we're part of, uh, showed that about 50% of young people had actually either uh, temporarily ceased or, or, or permanently ceased their business activities or seen some uh, reduction in their business activities. So over to our uh, panelists and researchers today uh, to tell us uh, some experiences they've had as they've looked at this space and some thoughts about how to uh, address these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, for that introduction and overview. Our next speakers are Yuan Zhu and Suresh Babu, who will be co-presenting on key success drivers of youth entrepreneurship in agribusiness. And they will also be discussing broad country findings and insights from their collaborative work on this topic in Nigeria. Yuan leads Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture's policy research and advocacy platform, and she also oversees their China program. Suresh Babu is a Senior Research Fellow and Head of Capacity Strengthening at IFPRI. Over to you, Yuan and Suresh. Thank you, Nandita. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today to present the methodology and the key results coming out of, of the joint research project between IFPRI and the Syngenta Foundation. We, since last year, we have been working on a few country studies looking at the key drivers of uh, youth entrepreneurship in agribusiness. And uh, the work on Nigeria has been completed recently, and we will share the final report with all the participants after this webinar. And the work on India and Bangladesh and Indonesia are still ongoing. We will publish our report once available. I'd like to start with the motivation of the country studies. Next slide, please. Firstly, there has very high growth of youth population in developing countries, especially in Asia and Africa. In Africa, the youth population is projected to increase by 40% from now to 2030. And a lot of governments with the increasing number of youth are struggling to educate their youth population and provide them with jobs and employment. As the rural youth population grows, there are huge opportunities to engage young people in agriculture and agribusiness not only in the primary production, but also to engage them in other functions of the value chain, such as input supply, processing, marketing, and distribution. At the same time, we realize there is a need for rural and agriculture transformation to achieve sustainable development goals and to achieve national food security and nutrition security at the country level, and this requires private sector participation. So connecting these two drivers on youth and private sector, we see uh, huge opportunities for youth entrepreneurship development. A lot of efforts have been made in the last decades. Many programs and initiatives from the government, from nonprofit donors and private sector, but the efforts and the development remain fragmented and uncoordinated. So through so our case study, we want to 
better understand the best practices um, on the ground and also to understand the roles played by different stakeholders. And we want to draw lessons and recommendations for future policy and uh, programs around youth entrepreneurship. Next, we have developed a conceptual framework for the country studies. Essentially, we categorize uh, the contextual factors and the drivers into four broad categories, including policy and enabling environment, institutions, institutional support, technology and infrastructure, and individual capabilities. And, and using this conceptual framework, we ran our case studies in all the three countries, and we conducted interviews with the many young entrepreneurs. The, the aim is to, uh, to collect and analyze the information and data for policy and program recommendations. Next. So now I'd like to share a few uh, key drivers from each of these areas. On the policy and regulatory environment, we are looking at if a country has got a national youth policy uh, or a youth strategy or even like a youth development fund and how uh, these are designed and uh, implemented in the country. We are also looking at the stage of development on, on the entrepreneurship ecosystem in a country. Another key driver is the access to finance especially to low-cost credit and insurance. Many young entrepreneurs start up their business by borrowing money from their families and friends. But as soon as they enter the expansion phase, um, capital constraints become a huge limiting factor. Next. On the institutions and intermediary organizations, supporting youth entrepreneurs, we pay special attention to access to knowledge and skill development. We also look at the roles of industry associations, youth associations, and farmer organizations, as well as the, the roles of uh, technical and educational institutions uh, in the youth entrepreneurship development. Next, um, the technology and infrastructure um, space. We are looking at key drivers such as access to technology and uh, its adoption by young people, and uh, also access to information and knowledge, as well as access to uh, rural infrastructure such as rural roads, logistics, transport, processing, storage facilities. Um, on the, a key driver I'd like to mention here is about digitalization. So connectivity and access to internet and to mobile data seems to be a crucial driver for young entrepreneurs, especially tech entrepreneurs who depend on this technology to promote their products and services. Next, uh, but not the least, on the individual capacities. So here we are looking at uh, entrepreneurs' incentives and motivation and their passion um, in agriculture and in uh, starting up a business. And we are also looking at their education, their access to continuous learning, continuous skill development, as well as their attitude to business and access to mentorship, etc. So with this, I'd like to hand over to Suresh to share some country-specific insights. Suresh, over to you. OK, thank you very much, Yuan. And thank you, Simon, for giving a very good overview. <clears throat> and Yuan, um, uh, thanks for giving that conceptual framework for uh, presenting the issues, constraints, challenges uh, facing youth entrepreneurship from a policy, institutional, and individual perspective. 
And what we did uh, in the program of uh, uh, studying uh, the countries that we will be presenting is basically use this um, conceptual framework to apply to individual case studies of um, the entrepreneurs in the countries themselves, uh, going to their field, going to their uh, uh, location of the business and, and interviewing them and studying uh, each one of them uh, in their own uh, lo locality and context specific situations. But uh, we'll be, I will be presenting three kind of uh, uh, countries that we studied and we start, we'll start with Nigeria now. Um, we'll be basically presenting broad set of uh, 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 the status presentation as well as the lessons that we have learned from uh, these countries. In terms of Nigeria, where we have um, a, a report that uh, after this presentation, you will be able to download for your feedback and comments, and we have, we have given it. Nigeria has a good set of policies uh, and, and strategies that it has developed for youth development and youth entrepreneurship in general. Um, but the challenge in the context of Nigeria is how to translate those strategies into specific investments uh, for for the for the for the youth to benefit from, um, and also in the Nigerian context, there is federal and the state kind of uh, implementation uh, system uh, translating national policies into state level implementation is also a challenge. But however, the youth entrepreneurship ecosystem itself is slowly developing, so we need to watch that. As, as, as we go along. Institutions are catching up in terms of uh, supporting youth uh, uh, entrepreneurship, but the value chains are kind of poorly organized because they are scattered all over, And but there are a lot of emergence of new value chains where youth can actually come and participate. But it is important that we make sure that the youth who enter into the agribusiness do not face a lot of risks and failures. That's something needs to be worked on in Nigeria. But let me come to uh, specific lessons now. Next, uh, Lucy. Uh, Nigeria particularly has a lot of lessons to share for rest of Africa. So that's one of the very good countries to study as a case study because many things are happening in the policy front, but there are also many challenges. One of the things that we found out, in fact, the picture you see in, in, in is a stakeholder consultation that we conducted in order to identify opportunities not only for youth but also agribusiness opportunities in fact that's a meeting uh, that that uh, brought together a set of ideas for youth uh, working with the mentors so the mentorship particularly for youth who are starting uh, as to start from uh, particularly the the universities uh, where the teaching is happening in agribusiness for example and for those who do not enter universities the youth need hand holding. Not only the skills and education are important, but they need to be equipped with other skills in order to uh, uh, enter the business. Initial capital seems to be a major constraint, but systematic access to initial capital will help youth to more youth to come into entrepreneurship. And also, social capital is very key in the context of Nigeria. Unless you know people. It is very difficult to operate in a business and even to start a business. So social capital, how do, how do we develop social capital? How do we network with other people is an important skill that we need to teach uh, the young entrepreneurs. In that context, agribusiness incubation centers can play a major role. It is just emerging slowly, but it can play a major role in order to bring the youth to the business and the interface of that would, would can happen in the incubation centers so that's we should we should probably keep that in mind in the context of nigeria but also nigerian uh, youth are very well connected to digital uh, and social media that can actually speed up the growth finally looking for opportunities within the system within the agricultural within the food system itself like extension input delivery seed and 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 uh, uh, seed, seed production for example and output aggregation and processing would be a good place where youth can enter. Let me move on to now Bangladesh. Lucy, please. Next slide, please. In Bangladesh, of course, it's a crowded place. Uh, a huge bulge of uh, youth uh, is available in the, in the rural areas, but they uh, all try to migrate to the urban uh, um, cities. And we will see that why that is a constraint as well as an opportunity. Uh, but policies and strategies uh, in Bangladesh have recognized agriculture, as a key uh, uh, industry for growth, as well as uh, role of uh, youth in uh, entrepreneurship uh, in, in the value chain. 
it has been high for some time particularly the growth of agriculture in terms of value chains you know aquaculture fisheries uh, poultry and agriculture has been going growing in in bangladesh and uh, to commensurate with that business ecosystem has also been uh, growing but it needs some additional support but it's still inadequate agricultural output marketing input supply are the key activities now youth are getting engaged in bangladesh there is reasonable development of rural infrastructure but it can it can be developed further because of the roads roads are connecting throughout the country so the youth are able to take advantage of that so that's one advantage compared to for example in nigeria reaching remote areas is very difficult but youth participation in the rural areas itself is missing because of the high level urbanization so we can actually think about how to take advantage of that in 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 youth entrepreneurship development next slide please the specific lessons from bangladesh are as follows the national programs are effective in training rural youth there are a lot of national programs uh, by the government sponsored training programs uh, but the role of ngos is also very important and and ngos have played a key role in bangladesh uh, in building youth and youth entrepreneurship um but youth can benefit from more organized value chain operations the picture you see is a picture of someone who is a youth who is developing a seedling nursery and selling it to the local farmers so that's a starting point of a value chain and then there is another youth who aggregate the products from the local farmers and take those products to the uh, uh the uh, nearest urban center that's another youth playing that role and in the urban center itself another rule another youth is purchasing this and giving it to the retailers there so it's another youth, uh, youth is involved there so that throughout the value chain how do we systematically landscape and identify opportunities for uh, youth is very important and bangladesh gives very clear examples of that but also thinking about agro ecology and how we can develop value chains to connect youth is important but there are a lot of emerging opportunities in bangladesh that can connect to uh rural entrepreneurship as well a lot more work to be done but there are very key lessons from bangladesh as well next we move on to india in indian case the recent policy changes such as uh, the removing of the essential commodity act also removing the monopsony of the local traders in the apmc act and also the improvement of the um, uh, business associations for contract farming is also providing opportunities for youth to come in in the indian context most of the youth are coming in with the support of the family the institutional support in terms of credit is still lagging but youth who has who have come into agri business who have been able to successfully operate we looked at uh, manage uh, the organization looked at 200 entrepreneurs how they have come into the business most of them have come through family support and self initiative however agri business centers have been created in most of the universities agricultural universities which are connected to um, the national banking system which is helping lot of youth to learn from the incubation centers what has been helping in india also the curriculum of the agri business um, in the universities have been driving youth into entrepreneurship that's something that we can learn from india and how do we inculcate the entrepreneurship as part of the curriculum and state level training programs uh, that support agriculture um, and there is quite a bit of subsidy that is given to youth that starts business in india but availing that subsidy and making use of that still requires the skill building of the youth and bringing them to the social network and also working them with the business associations in the local areas is very important these are the lessons from india and and we broadly saw three different countries in three different uh, you know so to speak uh, growth stage in development and how their policies and their institutions are supporting the youth and what needs to be done more but we will be sharing the reports with you as we go along please watch out our uh, website but let me at this point turn it over to you want to come and give us a closing kind of set of remarks uh, uh, that we have found from all these case studies thank you Yes. So, what are the broad uh, impl implications for developing countries? Um, and a lot of these points have been mentioned by Suresh already. So, I just want to add one final point. I think the government, non-profit, and the private sector all have very significant roles to play to support and developing youth entrepreneurship. 
and a multi-stakeholder approach is needed to make it happen. So with that, I will conclude this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Back to you, Nandita. Thank you, Yuan and Suresh. Uh, the next speaker that we have today is Patrice Mirindi, who is an agricultural economist and currently works as an entrepreneur support associate at the Anzija Price. A it's a collaboration between the African Leadership Academy and the MasterCard Foundation. And Patrice will be talking about his experience of mentoring youth entrepreneurs in the African countries. Over to you, Patrice. Thank you very much, Mandisa. As you have said, I am Patrice Mirindi. I'm from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I'm currently working with the Anzisha Prize as an entrepreneur associate. Um, so, uh, as an entrepreneur support associate, of course. Uh, actually, Anzisha Prize is a partnership between the African Leadership Academy and the Mastercard Foundation that seek to fundamentally and significantly increase the number of job generative entrepreneurs in Africa. Uh, our goal, of course, is to inspire, support young Africans with leadership potential to pursue and succeed in entrepreneurship. And my work is mainly focused on working and supporting young entrepreneurs who are involved in agriculture all over Africa. So I'm going to share like just some few lessons that I've learned since I was supporting them, and I will highly focus on the policy perspective and how the policy affects the business of young entrepreneurs. So the first um, aspect that I will raise is the access to finance, of course. So uh, that has been very challenging to young entrepreneurs on, in agriculture on the continent to access to finance. And I would like us to consider two things. Is the first is that, of course, there are organizations that um, are willing to support young entrepreneurs, but um, they, they don't. They want to reduce the risks of losing that money at all costs. And what happens is that most of the time they focus on those entrepreneurs who have already have market, who have already had made profit, or those who have collateral. And I would like to just, I want just to give a quick example with, of an entrepreneur who have been accepted, um, affected by this. I work with an entrepreneur in Gambia who work in the horticulture sector. And in, uh, especially when you're in the horticulture sector, you really want to have two things. You have to have adequate irrigation system and this storage facility. And the young entrepreneur has to, to go to different banks in, his, in Gambia to find uh, credit, but none of the bank were willing to to give him the credit just because he doesn't have a collateral and he didn't have a huge farm. I think he was work he was, he is working on a two hectare farm. So that is one of the challenge they they face practically. And the other part come to the uh, terms that are given to our young, to young entrepreneur in agribusiness. So we know that agriculture is usually something that take time to to start producing. So some countries like Kenya, Uganda, where they've been able to provide credits to uh, entrepreneurs, they also have the challenge of the payments. They take the loan today and the next month they start paying that loan. And it's hard for them. They, they can't be paying the loan and they've not reached the, they've not starting producing or making profits. That have been the main uh, challenges that I can raise on the credit part. The second um, part, I will raise it more on the skills and training. So uh, the, the good part of this is that, of course, I've been working with entrepreneurs and most of them have not really didn't go for agriculture studies, but they've been doing agriculture and they've been doing it well. So that have been that is a proof that, of course, for you to start an agriculture business you don't really need to have the skills but the challenge come when you have to be competitive with other people outside so when you need to be competitive and uh, now you require to have access to technologies to new technologies and they need skills they need to have the knowledge on how to use those technology in a more efficient way and that have been a challenge of course they start new businesses but when when they now want to be competitive and compete with other people who are 
uh, outside the continent or maybe with other entrepreneurs who have been in the agriculture sector for long, they get challenges and that's why it's very important to, for them to have the skills that is relevant and that will enable them to succeed in what they are doing. So and uh, now I will try to raise the aspect of marketing and pricing. So um, here it's very important to understand how they struggle when it comes to having access to, to raw material and also the issues of different structures. So basically they produce in rural areas and they have to, of course, bring the product in, in cities. So what happened is that first to get inputs, they are expensive and the input that are available, sometimes they are not adequate. We have an entrepreneur, for example, in, in Benin, she's produced she's producing uh, tomato puree and that's tomato puree required and she wants to have purely organic and now she's suffering how is she going to get organic tomato available in in the region and it's very hard for her to get those tomato but at least she's trying to uh, we are trying to work on, on that but that's happened what make it and at the end of the day all these issues of infrastructures, issues of getting raw materials, make them to have uh, their products become very expensive on the market. And it's hard for them to compete with uh, all the products that are coming from outside or are imported. So that is something that is really affecting the young entrepreneur on the continent. There is also the issue of perception. So we all know that when a product is of good quality, it sells your skill itself. But there is also those minds on ag African products, especially the agricultural product that have already a bad reputation. So when they go to the market, the marketing part becomes very tough for them. And also there are, of course, uh, today they talk about free trade, but there are a lot of non-tariff barriers of agricultural product that exist and it's really affect them, especially when we talk about standardization of products, it's, it's really challenging for them. So finally, I will also discuss on the issues with Chamber of Commerce. So basically the roles was in different countries was to support young entrepreneurs, to inform them about the realities that is happening on the ground, but those chamber of commerce are not really working adequately. And what happened is that young people are not aware about everything that is happening on the market. So it's really make them producing sometimes and they are not sure about where to sell. And when they have to sell, they are not sure about what will be the price. And all those challenges together make the journey a little bit um, tough and the success become very difficult. So, um, of course, there are many other issues that exist on a policy perspective, but for me, I believe those are the four key that we should, uh, policy makers should focus on trying to support very young entrepreneurs on the continent. So, uh, if I can just provide some recommendation, I think that I will start with the funding access. Uh, of course, uh, I think the, gov the different governments should be able to have some funds that is allocated to this aspect of, for young entrepreneurs in agriculture. Why? Because we, as I said, agriculture is something that takes time. So you don't make profit the same day you start planting. It's, uh, they need to have those kind of funding that can come either through grants or either through loan, depending on the case of each entrepreneur. So um, there is also uh, the issue of access to credit. So it's not only giving them uh, credit, but um, the, the, uh, the credit organization, if they are, they are banks, they also need to work with them to achieve their goals. Of course, they are young people. In Africa, we have a lot of uncertainty. We don't have adequate infrastructure. So there are a lot of difficulties that they need to face. Of course, they have the vision, they have the passion. So all those credits, they need all those credit uh, organizations need to work with the Chamber of Commerce and try to make sure that they have the adequate support even after they've received the money. And uh, the second part, on, again, on the part of training and skills, of course, we need first to change the narrative on entrepreneurship and agriculture on the continent. So people should stop thinking about agriculture or entrepreneurship as the last thing to consider after everything has failed, because that has been most of the time the story when people has a failed finding a job and they consider now let me go to agriculture so that needs to change so that people will understand that it's really important to make available all the support that is 
needed. Of course, the technology, as I said, there are lots of issues related to technology. So those technology doesn't need to just exist, but they have to be available in the continent, in the region of the entrepreneur. And of course, uh, they need to be adapted to the context of, of the entrepreneur. And also, when we come to training, of course, they need, we need to make sure that I would even suggest that agriculture go to primary schools in all the African countries so that people will start to learn, have the skills that are adequate to succeed in agriculture. And of course, entrepreneurship also needs to be introduced. Meanwhile, we need also to put parents and educators in this journey because those young people live to their parents' place. They need the support of their parents so that they will be successful in what they do. So, and also on the agriculture support, uh, of course, there are a lot of accelerators that are on the African continent. They try to provide support to entrepreneurs, but most of them focus on the financial part. They need to give them money. And here at Anzisha, we have been actively working to try to make sure that uh, which framework we can use to provide even the technical support, because it's not only about money. After they've got the money, we need to make sure that they succeed also in their journey. So um, finally, I, as recommendation is more to help, allow them to have access to, to inputs and raw materials that will enable them. So the governments need to make sure that those things are available for them and everything in the supply chain have the adequate resources. So that will allow African products to have, of course, a, a competitive price young people will be able to make profit because without profit we can't just tell them to go to agribusiness or and and be willing to do it and also they need to have platform that will inform them about the needs of the market and also the exact price that is available on the market so that they will be producing knowing how much they will earn at the end so just as a conclusion and so here at Azisha price we have realized that uh, of course um young people are more likely to uh, hire other young people. So what does that mean? Uh, if we support young people in agriculture, it means that, and we all know that uh, Africa is a young continent, and since they are willing to provide jobs to other young people as them, so the result will be like, it will lead to reducing unemployment on the continent. So as a closure, uh, it's just to say that, uh, of course, I believe that uh, if we put adequate policies to support young entrepreneurs on the continent, they have the potential to innovate in agriculture and they will change the agriculture in a way that we will be able to have build successful businesses. Up to you, Andita. Thank you. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, next, we have Mohammad Reza Ahmad Khan. He's a senior agricultural marketing officer with the Department of Agricultural Marketing in Bangladesh. He will provide key insights and recommendations for developing country government, not-for-profit organizations, and the private sector to support and strengthen youth entrepreneurship in agriculture. Over to you, Reza. Thank you, Randita, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. So, uh, to give my perspective uh, about this youth entrepreneurship and agribusiness in the rural areas. Uh, our government's commitment is clear because uh, we can root back uh, in 1978 when uh, Youth Development uh, Ministry was established first. And uh, consequently, now uh, the Department of Youth Development is working under presently the, the Ministry of Youth and Sports. And uh, we have a National Youth Policy 2017 that uh, gives clear indication of uh, government's commitment to develop youths and entrepreneurship in the country. Uh, there are uh, certain provisions like uh, developing banks for the youths, uh, covering women, young uh, people under banking and insurance schemes, and also establishing business incubator centers, uh, providing them with a special uh, credit schemes, and also uh, attaching them with these organizational development, organizational registration processes, all those things, there are many supports. And also uh, the social um, uh, youth welfare fund was created also to support them. And our prime minister is really committed. And uh, Sheikh Hasina National Youth Development Institute is also established in uh, 1998 as a 
center of excellence for developing uh, the youth entrepreneurship in the country. And presently also the information management systems uh, for the youth entrepreneurs is under development uh, as uh, for my knowledge goes. There are uh, certain uh, facilities uh, that is uh, provided to the youths uh, like the group based uh, credit schemes where family members or close relatives can uh, make groups and individuals can be given a certain amounts and they can be given also three times the loans uh, uh, so and the interest rates is also uh, like at around 10 percent and it is uh, decreasing gradually so there are individual credit programs also individual entrepreneurs can also can take the credit uh, after completing certain training skill development programs there are entrepreneurship development uh, credit programs also specifically which gives uh, enterprise level uh, credit facilities so basically the all the supports and facilities can be categorized uh, in terms of like financial supports skill and uh, uh, knowledge development and advisory and informational supports so uh, there are areas where more has to be done of course like the technology transfer part and also uh, like uh, the linkage market linkage is one important part because uh, after developing the products they have to sell those products and uh, the market linkage uh, both to the consumer markets and to the industrial markets uh, is needed to be done and also the market expansion in abroad those are the areas that we have to also work on uh, the challenges that generally face is uh, like uh, knowledge gap or skill gap and financial uh, problem that is common almost for all youth entrepreneurs and also uh, still now though our government is committed to develop infrastructure and many institutions still now uh, in terms of needed uh, things we have to do more and but uh, in case of particular uh, business uh, there could be challenges like access to land particularly when we'll be talking about um, agri business or agri production related uh, entrepreneurship then uh, there is the issue of conversion of agricultural land to other issues so those are some challenges there is also challenge of uh, shortage of uh, skilled labor uh, affordable technology so those are the areas that we have to really work on uh, under my uh, my own department they have completed agribusiness development project and we provide trainings to the youths uh, on post harvest management, marketing, value chain development, agribusiness development. So, those are their programs uh, under the uh, Ministry of Agriculture, also. Like uh, in our national agriculture policy, we have also a commitment to develop the agribusiness sectors and youths and women, particularly. So, those policy supports are there. But still, now, what is my insight uh, from my experience that I think there is uh, some areas that we have to improve or more like uh, the projects and the programs uh, that has to be communicated better uh, so uh, and there has to be promoted more so that the coverage can be increased and another challenge that we see that uh, to scale up the startups we need to provide more financial products and basically the risk management part the insurance products that has to be really worked on and uh, another uh, aspect uh, that should be taken into consideration because uh, youth entrepreneurship development is uh, a versatile works i think and so throughout the value chain there has to be there has to be multiple uh, parties the stakeholders involvement so there should be more coordination among public and private and also the development partners and more integrated uh, planning is needed uh, so that uh, more focused program development is possible which would be sustainable uh, for the youth's uh, entrepreneurship development and as uh, some also mentioned before that uh, agri business sometimes is there has some sorts of social stigma that uh, it is taken as a last resort for some somebody so there has to be promotional side it has to be motivated and market linkage has to be established then these programs would become uh, much more successful in terms of uh, coverage and in terms of scaling up the startups 
There are also other ministries involved in developing the youth uh, and the entrepreneurship. Like um, from the Prime Minister's office, there is access to information project, which is now converted as Aspire to Innovation. So under those programs, there are many uh, incubation and business idea development, application development, which were targeted specifically to agriculture. So ICT technology in agriculture is a vast area that is coming also. So those are the opportunities where we can tap more of the youths of the country to take the trajectory of entrepreneurship development. In a nutshell, uh, I think developing countries, a government should focus on uh, valuing up the skill, uh, skilled workforce. Simply say, for example, a mechanic mechanization, agricultural mechanization is going up. So there is possibilities uh, that your entrepreneurs can get into this trajectory as more machines would be required. So there will be requirement of skilled labor to repair and maintain those machineries too. So those are the new avenues coming up where uh, government can focus more and entrepreneurship development uh, can bring out the necessary uh, development pathways and reduce the unemployment rate also. In a nutshell, uh, as Bangladesh is uh, having a really demographic dividend because we have almost 50% of our youths, so it's around 55%. In the rural areas, it's around 71%. So it has to be taken more seriously and focus should be given. Thank you. Get back to you, Nandita. Thank you, Reza. Uh, our next speaker is Rajendra Jok, who is the CEO of Agri Entrepreneur Growth Foundation based in India. He will be talking about his experience on working in a not-for-profit on youth issues. Over to you, Rajendra. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure uh, to have this opportunity to express some of my thoughts in this forum today. The thoughts would be mainly related to agri-entrepreneurship program that we run in India. Let me first introduce my organization, uh, AEG Foundation. Agri-Entrepreneur Growth Foundation, as it is known, was set up jointly by Syngenta Foundation, Tata Trust, and IDH to scale up agri-entrepreneurship model. We call it AE model. AEG Foundation works with unemployed rural youth in villages and trains them to become agri-entrepreneurs. Let's uh, understand the rationale behind starting this initiative. We strongly believe that inefficient last mile delivery of products and services is one of the key reasons for low income of smallholder farmers. To address this challenge, this AE program was initiated under which we developed village level hyper local entrepreneurs to provide services and products to small farmers. It is actually a micro entrepreneurship and AE is expected to provide services to about 150 to 200 smallholder farmers. Under this program, each AE provides services such as access to credit, market linkages, access to high quality inputs and farm advisory support to the farmers. These services were not accessible to smallholder farmers earlier. Let's look at the current status of our AE program. The program which we started in 2014 actually underwent several iterations and the model now I would say is fairly standardized. As on date, we have about 3200 agri entrepreneurs and about 100 AE mentors. Through these agri entrepreneurs, we are connected to 350,000 smallholder farmers in 7,000 villages across 11 states in India. And our goal is to set up 100,000 agri entrepreneurs in next five years, which will then allow us to connect to 20 million smallholder farmers. So that's quite an ambitious goal, but it's definitely doable. The program once scaled up will significantly help in increasing income for millions of smallholder farmers and creating sustainable livelihood for tens of thousands of unemployed rural youth. This AE program is now a platform 
where all partners and AEs can seamlessly engage. This actually brings in more efficiency and additional value creation to agri entrepreneurs, farmers, as well as network managers and, and private sectors. Uh, in my view, the key contributing factors for the successful rural youth entrepreneurship in India are three. One, care, it is about careful selection and after screening of the village youth from a compact cluster who are then trained as agri-entrepreneurs. Their training and capacity building, including quality and content of the training, which covers agronomy, soft skills, and business skills. Second is the mentoring and handholding, is an ex extremely important factor. One mentor is assigned to every 25 to 30 agri-entrepreneurs, and he does mentoring for a period of two years. As this rural youth are first-time entrepreneurs, they need support on every aspect. Just to give an example, if they are not able to procure a product, the mentor steps in and connects them to the right distributor to avail it. And the third important contributing factor is partner ecosystem approach, rather than just focusing on training the entrepreneurs, which is what happens in many of the programs which are, which are running uh, today or have been done in the past. We have more than 100 partners, including input companies, market off-takers, banks, financial institutions, NGOs, etc. In our endeavor, we have good support from government, institutions, and private networks. The government is helping us in many ways. Uh, they basically provide certification of, for the training that we conduct. They help in creating policy for enabling entrepreneurship funding the programs in some states where we work with state livelihood missions and providing subsidies and support for infrastructure development such as nurseries market collection centers etc as regards the support from private sector i think market off takers and financial institutions have a vital role to play and they do provide great support to this initiative some companies are exploring this channel and might eventually make this mainstream for selling their products. In fact, there are companies who would like to focus on selling services rather than just the products. Example is spraying entrepreneur who, who provides a service because it's also important to demonstrate the safety pro protocols and the stewardship aspect while conducting the spraying services. NGOs have also been very supportive because of their local connect. I think they are able to identify right rural youth for these initiatives to be trained as entrepreneurs. They also provide us infrastructure for conducting training programs and they play an important role in training farmers and modernizing farming practices, which eventually lead to the business of agri entrepreneurs. Let's look at uh, some of the challenges faced by young entrepreneurs. Access to credit, I would say, is still a significant challenge, and we also saw it uh, when you are presented uh, for an agri entrepreneur to grow his business. Most of them do not have credit score and credit history, so banks are skeptical and reluctant to advance credits. We are mitigating this issue by developing credit scores and also providing first loss guarantee to banks so that they can fund our agri entrepreneurs climate change adequate water availability access to irrigation is another major challenge for agriculture food security and hence livelihood of a small smallholder farmer which in turn would impact the livelihood of young entrepreneurs as well policy framework in some cases such as getting licenses for setting up the business could also be a challenge and would need an improvement. Before I conclude, based on my Indian experience and key insights, I would like to make few recommendations to the governments of developing countries, nonprofit organizations, and also NGOs, which will help to support and strengthen the young entrepreneurship. Efficient last mile delivery of agriculture, services, and products 
is a key to agriculture and rural transformation. Youth entrepreneurship is the only option to ensure that this happens. Governments must facilitate credit and create enabling policy framework. Essentially, they should pro provide some what we call as ease of doing business for youth to become agri entrepreneurs. The private sector should embrace this idea and engage with rural youth in villages rather than continuing with their existing channels and NGOs uh, existing channels. Uh, as regards NGOs, I think they should lead this effort and be the lead partners in facilitating this to create entrepreneurial ecosystem. At the end, I would just once again like to reiterate that no one agency or foundation can deliver this mammoth task, but working with all like-minded partners in the ecosystem, we can certainly achieve this rural transformation through our fleet of well-trained and motivated agri-entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Rajendra. Before I introduce our last speaker for the day, I'd like to remind everyone to feel free to submit your questions in the questions box. We will have about 20 minutes of Q&A. If the question is for a specific presenter, please specify this. Last but not the least, our next speaker is Olu Bami Adarin Sola Agbato, who's a youth entrepreneur working in the field of aquaculture in Nigeria. She will talk about factors contributing to her success as a youth entrepreneur, the challenges she has faced during setting up and expanding her business. Over to you, Olubami. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Olubami Agbato, and um, I'm an entrepreneur operating in Ibadan Oyo State, Nigeria. Um, I'm the CEO for B Spice Fish Global Products, the aquaculture um, industry and is one of the fastest growing industry in Nigeria, known for its quality fish production. Um, we are into fish processing, although we do a little bit of farming also, but because of so many challenges, which I'll get to that part soon, because of so many challenges, we have in our company decided that most of our whole fish will be sold as a value added product. I mean, we'll be selling it out after we must have put one or two value addition before selling out. And also, we do not want to sell our fish fresh because we do not have enough yet. And also, if we add value, we'll be able to maximize our profit. So, moving on, I will quickly talk about the products that we have been able to achieve from fish. We have the fish powder, the fish crackers, fish cookies, we have cooking fillets, we have um, the popular restaurant has been widely accepted, especially by children, lactating mothers and all of that. Additionally, we train individuals, we train groups, and we train fellow entrepreneurs that are willing to learn about vision. And one of the key contributing factors to the success of our company, although we are still growing using um, the Instagram, using our websites, we have been able to use that to market our products a lot. And with that, we are reaching out to a large number of people, even outside of our own locality, outside of our own community. Also, one of the key contributing factors for me is the training. The training, I recently graduated from the University of Ibadan, where I got my training on aquaculture marketing and product development. I did aquaculture and fisheries at my first degree and then um, marketing and product development for my MSc, which I just graduated from. Also, one other major thing that I realized that has helped us a lot is being creative. Yes, what do I mean by being creative? We try to produce fish that are not the usual from what is already available in the market. I, I mean, we try to do something different and something that you can easily find on the shelf. We try as much as possible to put a lot of a, a lot of shelf life, something that can last on the shelf, something that can, we, we do what I would call post-harvest 
um, preservation processes to avoid losses in the aquaculture industry. Another thing that has helped us is our emphasis and the little bit of sensitization we are doing as to the importance of fish intake and uh, moving on, consistency and passion. Consistency and passion. I've been doing this along my team consistently with so many challenges. Nonetheless, we have refused to stop doing it. <laughs> That's on a lighter note. We, we have, I mean, we have faced a lot of challenges, but then we are still in the business. We are still doing it despite all the challenges. So far, so good. We have not gotten any support from the government. We have not gotten any support from any institution per se, but we have gotten from an NGO sometimes, like a seed grant, which is meant for us to use to practicalize and see if really we can do this thing before they now think about, you know, additional um, increase in the grant, whereby we can now expand and do more. Uh, I got support from the university. That is where I got my technical um, training from. And my entrepreneurial journey has also provided opportunity for me with some other organization whereby I'm asked to come and, you know, say something about my product, share my challenges and things that I've done like this type of opportunity now. Moving on to the challenges we have faced so far. Number one challenge that is common to every agriculture industry is the finance. Is the finance, I say again, is the finance. It's actually very unfortunate that having learned this, uh, this uh, field of work, having gone through it for years, you still come out of the university to start like somebody who has not passed through any form of education because this industry is actually is actually it, it involves high investment i mean it is capital highly capital intensive it is highly capital intensive and mm -hmm. if we are going like this it only means that we are going to start small and remain small which is what we don't want to do we, we know some of the things that will help us to actually move higher. But some policies, although we have policies in Nigeria, but there, there are some enforcement that needs to be done to that policy in terms of price regulation to our produce, in terms of marketing. Sometimes we don't have uh, like off takers. If you see people who cannot even do the, the, the products as much as we can do it following the level of um, hygiene and other things that we follow. But because they have some form of, uh, like I say, backup, they are, you, are, you see them penetrating other markets that you should penetrate. And because of lack of infrastructures, that there are some, for instance, storage facilities such as freezing and so many others, there are some a facility that is needed for a food fish processing company. They are always very capital intensive. Talking about having a power, a constant power supply, you can't do without that. It's a lot of things because we deal with perishable. Talking about fish, we deal with perishable. So these are challenges. And getting funds, getting money to, to do all these things is actually difficult, quite difficult. Some grants are available, but the question is, are they easily accessible to small and micro entrepreneurs? No. You are asked to bring something you do not have as um, something you will, you will use to stand to collect loan from the bank, things like that. Another challenge I faced while practicing is the cumbersome process of certification. For instance, we want to certify our product so that we can reach a large number of people. We can reach, we, we, we have a way of doing different sizes whereby we can meet the low income earners, medium income earners, and the large income earners. But we realize that we do not have, we are not, we could not expand beyond the little weight that we have because we do not have some facility that we will use to produce in large quantity to meet all this demand. The market is, is quite available but we can't meet up all this market because of certifications, because of certification. And um, 
practically on the field, another challenge I face is um, communal disputes that happens between we the farmers and other land users. For instance, managing the the, the, gen, the waste that we generated from our industry. So those are those are the so those are some of the things that we have faced. Um, also, inadequate land. For instance, I have a challenge. I think it's rather peculiar to being a woman, and that is when you want to get land in Nigeria. Being a woman. <laughs> you are rather have to go through your husband or some other you know that gender thing is also there so moving on i will advise or recommend that the government should do a kind of price standardization and when these uh, policies are made they should be enforced they should be enforced properly the certification process should be less cumbersome there should there should be some that would be would be for maybe a small micro enterprise, uh, a small to medium enterprise, medium to large scale enterprise, so that we all are not in the same problem and we are not we have not even finished sorting out the problems that is on table that are peculiar to us and we are already facing problem of how do I generate how do I pay task uh, I have to pay my tax. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot. Because of our time, I will move on. I will also um, recommend that the private institutions should come up with sensitization programs, like uh, you know, sensitization programs that can make help, help other people to know more about the products first of all, and then it will gear mm -hmm. other youth entrepreneurs to do aquaculture. Because as some people are willing to join, a lot of people who have tasted the challenges and have seen a little bit of it are running away from the business. You see a lot of farms that are condemned and so many other things. I will also say that they should create a small holding facility whereby that graduates will go and um, the, the graduates can go practicalize and you'll be sure that this person can actually do this thing very well when she or he or she gets to the field. So those are the things that are needed to be done. If we create a small facility, and then the institution, my recommendation to the institution is that they should create entrepreneurship program in their curriculum, whereby right from university, you are learning something, you're being practical as if you're already in the business. Entrepreneurship should be in the curriculum right from the beginning to your final year in the university. And the institution can also work hand in hand with government, with the NGO, so that they'll be able to help source for this fund, knowing that students or youth cannot go, but if they go as a group, if they are if they are if they have support hand in hand with this with government, they can use that to assist youth entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. I will also I, I, I'm sorry, Nandita, I know you're trying to run me up because of my time. I will also tell the, my fellow youth entrepreneurs that are listening to me that it is very important to be available. You can't run this enterprise, especially being an aquaculturist, without being available. You have to be available and then you have to be persistent, be a creative and get the right mentorship. Thank you very much. Over to you, Nandita. Thank you so much, Olubomi. Uh, now it's time to open up for q and I'd like to invite all of the speakers to turn on their webcams and keep them on for the rem remainder of the event. We ask the audience members to continue submitting their questions through the question box and we'll do our best to address them. So I will now start by giving out the first question. Patrice, here is a question for you uh, by Nitesh Agni Otri who is stating, asking, what are the challenges in converting traditional agricultural practices into technology-based farming and ensuring that youth adopt such strategies? So from your experience in Africa, if you could respond to this question. Over to you, Patrice. This is a question from Nitesh Agnehotri, who is asking, what are the challenges in converting traditional agricultural practices into technological-based farming and ensuring that youth adopt such strategies. Okay, thank you very much for, for that question. 
I think that um, they, uh, I think even our young people, uh, the good part with young people is that they are always willing to use new technologies. They are always willing to to apply um, new techniques that have that are coming. But the challenge, especially in the production part, is that the information is not translated to them. They are not trained about it. And if you can see in many uh, rural many farm agri young people in agriculture, especially on the production part and in rural areas, and they have connectivity issues. So there are a lot of challenges that happen and in terms of them getting the information. So I believe the best way to make them use new techniques is just to make sure that they get the right information, but they are really willing to, to apply them. Thank you so much, Patrice. Uh, the next question is for Rajendra. This question is coming in from Dolopo Adiyaunji, who's a PhD student at the University of Nairobi and also a research intern at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. And in the same theme is, a, is another question from Mahashmi Das. So here is a combined question for you, Rajendra. Uh, what are some of the issues you think have come up in terms of the extent to which a career path for young people can be directed towards agriculture, seeing that the current youth entrepreneurs experience has been challenging and in some cases disappointing as well. Over to you, Rajinder. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. If I understand it correct, I think I think the question is, uh do we find people do we find difficulty in getting people uh working in the field of agriculture right this Correct. Would, uh, okay, Correct. okay. Uh, yeah i think educated youth today have lots of other opportunity and traditionally agriculture has not been not been doing so well as uh, uh the officer from bangladesh explained it's still a bit of a area where it's seen as last resort for young uh, today's youth unless he has a family business and he just one or two children in that business then he tends to get into agriculture but if it is say three or four children then the land holding in india is so small average land holding in india is 1.15 hectares yeah and and uh, that's true with about 90 percent of the total uh, farmers in india so in such a small land holding if you have number of children and therefore the the income to be divided uh, three times or four times then it is not worth uh, having having that kind of an opportunity and therefore uh, some of them would like to get better education go to cities go to uh, states where they can earn their livelihood through jobs but this is exactly where we are encouraging this agri entrepreneurship that even if he does not want to work in his own farm he can support about 200 farmers where by providing inputs by providing access to credit by their market linkages in each of that activity he earns a commission and and over a period of two years of handholding and incubation that that we I, I talked about after that he starts earning a decent livelihood especially when he's staying in his own village and in his own property he can also do a bit of agriculture uh, when the opportunity is there but he also supports 200 farmers and that is where the we have started a kind of reverse flow where village youth when they see their friends getting into entrepreneurship and seeing that they are earning better livelihood, they tend to get attracted and, and join our uh, training program and entrepreneurship program. And that is exactly the way we are promoting uh, our, uh, our program, AE program. Yeah. Thank you, Rajendra, for respond, so responding to that question. Uh, now I have a question for you, Reza, from Tushar, Tushar Pandey, who's an advisor in financial policy and services at Grant Thornton, Bharat and Bihar. His question is, what's the level of technology-led financial services delivery, such as AgTech and FinTech in Bangladesh? Uh, over to you, Reza. Thank you, Nandita. If I understand the questions correctly, that uh, I mean, is is it about agriculture and technology transfer? 
and financial in inclusion. Financial services. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, uh, in in a nutshell, uh, there are a lot of uh, credit supports in the agriculture sector too, particularly for the mechanization part. Now, government is really committed to increase our mechanization. And also, as uh, Mr. Rajendra also put it uh, nicely, that agriculture is really, uh, we need to add more value on the agriculture. So we are focusing more on the processing and value chain development parts, high value agricultural parts. And as I mentioned, the mechanization parts. So there are incentives, there are uh, government policies to support those areas. But uh, I think uh, private sector can come up with uh, financial products too, because it's, it's, it's a, multi-partite uh, uh, ecosystem actually so everyone has to get involved uh, also as uh, mr Rajat also said that it's not a job for a single uh, entity <laughs> like uh, in my country a department of youth development is the um, business allocated uh, organization mandated uh, for youth entrepreneurship development but obviously as we see that uh, there are uh, many linkages with the ICT sector, with the agriculture, with many other sectors, fisheries and others. So there has to be this integration of projects or programs, whatever is there. And particularly for the financial products and technological products, there has to be uh, those linkages where government is paying their part but to scale up, to make it more available. Private sector should get into this area and development partners they have also their roles to play. I think in Bangladesh, there is IFAC who also finance certain private um, entrepreneurships in this respect. So is that answered correctly? Yes, thank you so much, Reza. Uh, moving on, uh, the next question is for Olu. Uh, by Esselin Shaw from Todar Todarok, who is a master's student in the International Environmental Studies at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. His question is that, you know, we often hear a mention of the importance of market linkages, but nobody really seems to address these issues. Is there any way or any advice that you could give for ensuring that there is better creation and insurance of market linkages for youth entrepreneurs? Over to you, Olu. Thank you very much. If I understand the question very well, it means that is there a, a market whereby you can take this produce to or how do you market what you have produced is that the question yes correct okay so um i will give you an example here in my in my company we use digital marketing but then if you produce so much there's something that operates in um Ogun state southwestern parts of nigeria here there's something they call a fish community it's like a fish village. So when you produce, and uh, maybe you produce in groups, you can actually take this produce to that place and sell. All the other farmers that are operating in that place sells the same price. So it means that you have to belong to an association. And in that association, you have to follow their rules and regulations and you sell at the price they have the type of uh, of make size that they use for those in the fishery industry and for people that are the aquaculture industry they have different prices for different sizes so there are markets there are markets for products if you're talking about aquaculture products and there are off takers and that fish community is a good example thank you thank you Olu, uh, for answering that question uh, I would like now to turn it over to Suresh. A question has come up uh, asking about the mention of new policies in the area of youth entrepreneurship in agriculture in the Indian context. And the audience member would like to know what specific modifications or development have happened in the recent years which could increase opportunities for youth entrepreneurs in India. Over to you, Suresh. Okay. That's a very good question. And uh, I started off in the Indian case study. I started off with the new policy measures that have been put in place in the last, uh, actually, one or two months. In, in, and, and that gives enormous amount of opportunity for rural youth to come in. Um, but with respect to specific uh, opportunities, 
uh, one would think about this APMC Act that has been uh, liberalized now, uh, immediately gives uh, youth in the rural areas to get in the uh, output aggregation. Um, and also uh, uh, connecting the outputs to the processing industries, for example, they can also get involved in value chains uh, that are developing in various parts of the country. And also the, uh, the, the other policy that is liberalized or emphasis has been given in terms of investments in the producer organizations, the contractual contract farming. And these are all opportunities right away that youth can jump in. But what is the major challenge I see right now is these policies, they have to be implemented at the state level. And the state level uh, institutions, state level organizations to develop youth at the state level is not ready yet, in, at least in, in most of the states. Um, so that is the next step we have to invest in. And uh, some of us are talking to the state level uh, uh, policy makers on that. And we need to at least in the Indian context show uh, to four to five states that have taken these policies, the national policies, and have used them for the benefit, benefit of the youth entrepreneurs, then it will catch up like a wildfire. In fact, uh, the program that Rajendra is using can also think about that uh, in terms of how at the panchayat level, uh, how at the group village level, at the mandi level, for example, when the mandi is dismantled, so, so to speak now, uh, how can we bring in the youth in order to take over the roles, but that requires special training in, uh, for, for business skills training, uh, social skill training, and or, uh, organizational training for youth. You know, they can't just say, go and do it, you know. So let, policy is there, go do it. No, it's not going to happen. So we need to be organizing ourselves to bring the youth to the opportunity. So that's something that we need to do in India. Let me stop here. Thank you so much, Suresh, for that. And just to be respectful of everyone's time, I'm now going to pose the final question to Yuan before uh, closing the session. Yuan, this question is from Moshfikal Talukhtar, who's asking that, you know, youth are becoming the vehicle of agribusiness in uh, possibly in the next decade. And we'd like to focus on partnership ecosystem where digitization and agri mechanization would be the best way to transform agriculture. In this context, has SFSA taken any steps with regard to youth in this ecosystem and agri mechanization? Over to you, Yuan. Thank you, Nandita, for the question. So this is a very good question. And Xinjiang Foundation has been active in both the digitalization space and also the mechanization space due to higher labor cost um, of doing agriculture in Asia and Africa. So mechanization is becoming a, a trend for farmers to uh, save cost and especially labor cost and improve efficiency in their work. So in both Senegal and Mali, we have a, a big program called Senma program, where we help local farmer union and farmer association to set up a service which they can provide mechanization services to farmers with their tractors and uh, other uh, combined harvester and other uh, agriculture mechanization uh, machines. And uh, in Senegal especially, so farmers could plant two times the rice because of the mechanization. So this way they can increase their income dramatically. And um, digitalization, so in our India and Bangladesh program, both the uh, youth entrepreneur programs in Bangladesh is Farmers Hub, India is Agri Entrepreneur. We try to leverage digital platform and digital software to record the data on the farmer level and also the sales and marketing data to facilitate um, decision making and also to um, to leverage the, these digital services um, for for the entrepreneurs to to be able to um, to check their revenue cost etc to make the the model more sustainable. Over to you, Nan Nandita. Thank you so much, Yuan. Uh, I'd now like to wrap up the session by starting by thanking all of our speakers for their remarks and our audience for attending this event. If you'd like to send in comments or questions about today's webinar, please feel free to contact Suresh and Yuan. You can now see their contact details appearing on your screen. 
You can also contact Lucy Talbot. Her contact details are available in the events registration email that you received. Uh, as a reminder, the event recording and slides will be available on IFPRI's events page. And I would like now like to thank everyone again, and please have a great day. Thank you for joining us today.